thanks for coming. Um, this is um, a collaboration between the Common Action Free School and One Heart for Congo. Um, and uh, Kristen and our friends here, I'm um, sorry, I don't, know everybody's, I don't remember everybody's name yet, uh, but uh, are gonna present on the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the local Congolese community, the conflict there, and so on, better informed um, today. Um, if you would like, oh, I should tell you a little bit about the free school. Um, the free school, the Common Action Free School is a uh, uh, local education project that is all based on um, uh, the idea that uh, act, education is activism, and um, it's run by consensus, all volunteers. We have planning meetings twice a month about um, what we vote on, what we're going to do. If you would like more information about that, um, you can talk to myself or a few other preschool people in here. Um, there's an email list, and if you would like to make a donation, um, I wrote a children's book that you could have <laughs> for a donation. Um, it's basically anarchism for kids. Um, and uh, and then a, a little mini zine here, which is uh, whatever. It's not that cool, but it's if you want to donate to the preschool, you can, or if you don't want to donate, whatever. I don't care. You can have one. It's okay. Um, so anyway, turn it over to Kristen. Thank you. I'll get the light when you're done. Okay. Tracy, do you want to help me like? What? Yeah. You want me to hit it now? Yeah, that's fine. I'm Kristen, everyone, and. I'm with One Heart for Congo. Um, oh, so dark. Okay, well, if you guys just want to introduce yourselves, and so dark, I like that. <laughs> My name is Mark. I'm uh, from uh, Congo. I've been here for seven years, and uh, I uh, work at ICU. I'm also ICU student. I'm graduating in this main uh, network at the education management. I have three daughters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name is uh, Youngblood. I've been here for one uh, year and uh, maybe a six year and seven months. Uh, I've worked to CITAS. I'm, uh, uh, I'm studying ESL class to athlete community. I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I volunteer with the organization One Heart for Congo um, since about 2009. I act as the, the um, organization's public relations, just anything that we need help with. I'll help to. And then there's a lot of other people involved in One Heart for Congo here too. If you guys want to stand up, you can. <laughs> organization I'll get into it a little bit more later but it's basically to assist the local Congolese community and to raise awareness about the conflict that's going on in the Congo um, I do have some flyers up at the table of our organization with some information about the conflict so if you guys want to pick one up you can um, actually Trace, I'm gonna have you go back one slide so there's arrows here um, so I just have these two questions up here if, just to kind of like start our discussion. Um, so if you guys, we can, I, we can just discuss it. Um, what do you guys already know about the Democratic Republic of the Congo? Mm -hmm. uh, they produce a lot of materials that we use in cell phones and other technology. Right. Yeah, there's a lot of, it's really rich in natural resources. I think there's a large river that goes through it. And yeah. There's a lot of jungle. <laughs> when they were under the control of the Belgium, they lost about a third of their population, and no, they, I think they had one college graduate by the time the Belgians left because they refused to ever educate them. Especially like within Bloomington Normal, um, like I said, there's 
there's a large po Congolese population here in Bloomington Normal. So what does that mean to you guys? I think it just adds a lot of diversity uh, to our own community and brings new ideas to us. No. Yeah. I think for members of immigrant communities, it means being able to go to a group of people that you have something in common with and are able to, um, I guess, share whatever you're having trouble assimilating with in the new community that you're in. So being able to take that back to your comfort zone. Yeah. Anyone else? Bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, just, I was just thinking, I think it helps to remind us that we're all more interconnected than we than we tend to believe. But a lot of times I think when it comes to different things that are outside of maybe our country or outside of our area, we feel like we're too disconnected. It's too far away. That's going on over there. What can we really do? But when it's brought to literally your community, essentially your front door, then it reminds you that we are, are more connected than we sometimes like to believe that we are. Um, adding on to what she said, I'm a college mentor here where I like underrepresented kids in Bloomington. And I think that it's um, like our episodes like these that kind of make the difference for like us students. Like we're not here just to go to school, but we are also like learning about what's going on in our surroundings yeah. and being like informed. Definitely. Okay, well just a note on this presentation. I'm going to kind of be going through a basic <laughs> history of the Congo and sort of what's going on there and what's going on in our community. Um, but feel free to jump in with questions or discussions. And um, Yamber and Mark are both from the Congo, and Baye has been very involved with the organization in the Congolese community, so they're there to answer questions, um, especially you know, Mark and Yamber are from there, so feel free to direct questions towards them, and they'll answer them as best as they can. Um, so we'll kind of do it that way. Does that sound OK? All right, cool. Go up to. Uh, to the right one, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So here's a picture of Africa. Uh, the DRC is located directly in the center of Africa. Um, just some basic statistics about it. The population is 65 million people, and it's the largest, the second largest country in Africa, and the 11th in the world. So it really, it's a huge part of um, contribute contributor to economics and political issues around the world. Uh, Gina had mentioned that it's a French-speaking country. It's all, they also speak Swahili, Kikongo, Chaluba, and Swahili, did I say that? Yeah. Lingala and Lingala. Um, <coughs> the current president is Joseph Kabila. Does that have anyone, has that name? Has anyone heard that name before? It's been pretty prominent in the news in terms of the Congo. Does anyone do you guys want to say anything about the president or the elections or? Yeah, so we had an election last year in November, and we have a leader since uh, President Mobutu, which his name is Chisekedi. Uh, uh, he was elected. The population chose Chisekedi, but uh, they are. They did things that they let Joseph Kabila to take the power. So the population tried to react to that uh, situation, but they uh, used arm to take them down. So he's still in power so today. But yesterday in the South, some group of uh, people try to take uh, control of the south east of uh, the country by the they didn't uh, they didn't succeed can everyone hear okay okay um so there's been a lot of issues regarding the president there at the elections last year um Kibilo was like mark said was re-elected and um it's kind of caused of an uproar for the past few year as to the political situation. There's a lot of, um, with the vote, there was just a lot of problems with that. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, 
but Congo has the second highest rate of infant mortality, and they're bordered by nine different countries. So it's a con it's a country that's living in extreme poverty, um, and so that that's contributing to a lot of the problems as well. Um, here are just some facts about the potential of the Congo. Uh, like it was mentioned earlier, am I blocking you? Um, <laughs> there they have many natural resources. The country is extremely wealthy, but they're exploited by the international community. Um, in particular, some of the countries surrounding the DRC, Rwanda, Uganda, um, they're contributing at large to this conflict. Um, the, most of the population in the Congo is, a majority of them are children, um, who, you know, some of them are being forced into being child soldiers, they're not given proper education, and um, they're just not able to reach that potential to kind of make a difference in the country right now. Um, you had said, I'm sorry, what was your name? You, you. Oh, sorry, yeah. George. What's that? George. George had mentioned about Colton and the, the mineral that's in our cell phones and how that's contributing um, to this conflict. Uh, there, the Congo possesses 64% of the world's coltan, and coltan is, a, is a, a mineral that's in all of our cell phones, our computers, all of our electronics, we use coltan, and that's all coming from the Congo. The, this coltan's being mined by child soldiers and people within rebel army groups, and so that our, the great production of it is contributing to the conflict as well. Um, just some other facts about natural resources. It, Congo has 34% of the world's cobalt and 10% of its copper. It's part of the second largest rainforest in the world. And someone had mentioned about rainforests or something like that earlier. <coughs> and it has a hydro capacity to provide electricity for the entire African continent, uh, continent Southern Europe, and parts of the Middle East and the agricultural capacity to feed the entire world through 2050. So they're a country that's very rich in natural resources and they're not able to have any control over that right now. So even though they're one of the wealthiest countries, they're the poorest country. This is just a quick timeline. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read through this entire thing. Um, but someone had, you guys had talked about already, you know, that they were occupied by Belgium. Um, Mark had talked about Mobutu being in power. Um, and then we go into the Civil War. And we talked about most, are you guys familiar with the conflict in Rwanda and the genocide there? Um, well, most of that had spilled over into Eastern Congo. So if you remember that map of the Congo, uh, the Eastern side of the Congo borders Rwanda. And most of what was happening there had spilled over. So right now, even most of that conflict in the DRC is on the eastern side of the Congo. So I mean, people, did you guys want to talk about kind of what that's like in terms of geographics with the conflict? Yeah, so the genocide of Rwanda, the genocide in Rwanda, so I can say that uh, many years ago, they had a problem in Rwanda, and the Tutsi, the Tutsi group, came uh, in uh, Congo. So I remember having uh, many friends from Rwanda. But uh, in '96, uh, they went back in their country, and uh, that, uh, that year where the genocide starts, and they uh, killed all. They were against Hutu, and the Hutu came, came in uh, Congo just to avoid to get killed in Rwanda. And uh, to avoid one day Hutu uh, to come back and try to take power, so they are trying to kill them even they are hiding in uh, Congo. They are using this uh, 
arguments to use Colton and also killed to secure their power, Tutsi power in Rwanda. Does anyone have any questions so far? I'm sorry, I'm just kind of talking. Is, is the Democratic Republic, is it landlocked? Is it like blocked off from its uh, western border of the ocean? I'm sorry, what? It looks like Angola it, is on the water. Is it landlocked? Yeah, Angola is right there. So, so he's they are landlocked. Yes, yeah. so we have a small access of, to the ocean. Okay. for Congo, but it's a really a dictatorship. Because Mark, you said that the people elected somebody, but then somebody else is actually in power. Yes. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so they hold, so then elections are held, but then uh, like military force installs whatever leader they want, basically, or is that? Yeah, so we choose Chisekedi, but they forced us, they put Kabila, and we try to to react against the, that uh, situation by the uh, sent soldier. So is Kabila in control of the army? Yeah, Kabila is in control. Okay, yeah. so it's the army that enforces yeah. the rule. Then you can also find many videos on Facebook. <laughs> okay, so um, we were talking about the conflict. It's been going on since 1996, and it's the longest war in Africa's history. It's also known as the deadliest war since World War II. Um, over 5.4 million people have died. Rape is a really large issue happening in the Congo right now. It's used as a weapon of war within cultural um the way that their culture works, a lot of men are raping women, and then these women are being abandoned by their husbands um, out of shame. So that's a really big issue, and it's tearing communities apart in the Congo, and it's really contributing to their lack of development there. 80% um, of the population lives on 30 cents or less a day, and like I mentioned before, the international community is looting. Uh, all their natural resources. So all of these factors are contributing. The political corruption, the poverty, um, everything is contributing to this conflict. So it's a very complicated and complex um, set of issues here. Um, we talked about the conflict minerals. And I'm going to go through there. I have a few video clips and things to show you here. So I'm just going to show you quickly. I don't know. We might have to exit out of this. Um, just to kind of give you guys a better idea, I just think they're useful videos to look at. You might have this up already. Hey, I'm John Prendergast of the Enough Project. Uh, I've been working on conflicts and in conflict zones in Africa for 25 years now. But I've never seen anything like human devastation in Eastern Congo. Violence there is worse than anywhere else in the world. The deadliest conflict in the world since World War II. And the highest rates of sexual violence in the entire world. It is the most dangerous place to be a woman or a girl. The direct connection between our consumer appetites and the violence in Eastern Congo. It's a result of this, your cell phone. Basically, there are four minerals that come from the Congo that are in every one of our electronics products. Gold, and what we call the three T's, tantalum, tin, and tungsten. Tantalum stores electricity in your phone. If you didn't have tantalum in your phone, tungsten makes your cell phone vibrate. 
And tin is used to solder on the circuit board. Congo has a lot of tin. Gold is used to coat the wiring, and it's the highest value metal inside every cell phone and laptop. That's why we call them conflict metals. So here's how minerals in the Congo get from the mine to your mobile phone. But basically, the armed groups in eastern Congo act like a mafia. The mines themselves are controlled and taxed by these armed groups, by these militias. And then the smuggling routes, as they're smuggled across the borders to neighboring countries, particularly Uganda and Rwanda, those smuggling points are all controlled by these armed groups. All these places are making huge amounts of money by taxing and stealing the resources and smuggling them out of the country. <coughs> and the tool of choice, the human rights violation of choice of the militias and armed groups in the Congo is rape in order to intimidate populations and punish populations for supporting other groups. When the minerals are smuggled out of Africa. They head to Asia to smelting companies in Thailand, Malaysia, China, and India to be refined. Here, Congo's minerals get mixed together with other minerals from around the world, making them difficult but not impossible to trace. Finally, the three T's of gold are processed into components, and they end up all over the world in the products we know and love. Cell phones, Blackberries, laptops, iPods, video game systems, and digital cameras. So that's all the bad news. The good news is because we have a direct role in fueling the violence, as innocent and inadvertent as it might be, we actually have a role in bringing it to an end. The first thing we need to do is to create a demand, a consumer demand for conflict-free products. We need to get in touch with our cell phone manufacturers and our laptop companies and tell them we want conflict-free products. Hopefully, helpful explains <coughs> what's going on with the comp or the minerals there. To control click it. What do I have to say? Control click it. Usually, but. Does that work? No. <laughs> Could make it paste it. If you make it full screen, the link will work. Okay. It should. And this next thing that I want to show everyone is just a, well, first of all, the Neff Project who has put together these videos and this website. They're just another organization that um, works to raise awareness about the conflict in the Congo and other countries as well. This website shows the different, in the video, you saw different um, companies. And they talked about how these companies are contributing to the conflict uh, by not buying conflict-free minerals. And this kind of shows us some of the, the companies that we buy electronics from every day and that we use and where they're at in terms of supporting conflict-free minerals or not. Um, the first ones here in the green are one companies that have taken proactive steps in uh, supporting conflict-free min uh, minerals. So you can see HP, Philips, um, Dell, Apple, Microsoft, all these have, and as we move into yellow, um, these are people who have done less to promote conflict-free minerals, and red are kind of the people who you don't want to buy from. So Canon, Nikon, Sharp, HTC, and Nintendo are all companies that really haven't done anything um, and need some encouragement there. So just a quick look at that. Does anyone have any questions about that? Yeah. 
Uh, what kind of steps do they take? I'm sorry, what? Uh, what kind of steps did like the green companies take? Um, those companies are working on buying minerals that have not been produced um, with child soldiers and are not part of like conflict zones. Um, if you want to look on that website, it gives more information about that. But if you guys want to jump in about anything with how these things are mined and information on that, um, do you guys have anything to say about that? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those companies are just people who have taken steps, and I think a lot of it has to do with people who are, aren't buying from these producers um, or writing letters to them saying, hey, like, we want conflict free minerals. The same with you, if you've seen like Blood Diamond or people who are trying to purchase or companies who are trying to purchase diamonds that are not considered Blood Diamonds. It's the same with these minerals. Is there another question? Back? No? Okay. Um, we had talked about sexual violence and how Rape, in the video they talked about it as well, how rape is their weapon of choice and how it's really deteriorating communities there. Now, this is a really big issue. Our organization tries to focus on raising awareness about that. Um, uh, it's known as the rape capital of the world. And uh, the in the DRC, there's 434,000, sorry, I'm missing a zero there, rapes per year in the DRC. And if you just compare that to the 82,000 rapes per year in the United States and put that perspective of the sizes of the countries, um, it's, it's a huge, huge issue there. Uh, and like I said before, there's the issue of cultural abandon, abandonment. So once, do you, do you guys want to explain this? Yeah, so uh, in our culture, being a woman, being a wife, uh, it's on an honor for the girls and the, her family. So it's also representing a power for the men. So have access or touch the woman, it's a like make her husband weak. So that's what they are doing, just uh, make all the men weak, and uh, that's way they can uh, have power on uh, all men. So, uh, if you you have your wife raped, so it's uh, like a shame for yourself, and uh, many of uh, those men choose to to abandon their uh, wife so that way they can stay away from uh, that uh, shame. That they are trying to hide that uh, shame by uh, sending uh, their wife away. And what usually happens to the women after that? Yes, after that the woman will be rejected even in her own community. She'll be abandoned because she represents a shame for her husband also the community. Is, is there any movement with, with, within any of the men in the Congo to, to, to sort of address that part of the culture that women are disposable and is there, are there, yeah, sorry, like are there groups of men that are trying to address this as a problem? Yeah, I think they are because uh, there are some organizations uh, trying to help those women and a group of uh, men trying to keep that uh, situation, that uh, issue to the public. And those people are just sh shut down by the government because they don't want people out that outside their country to know all the, those uh, violence made on uh, people. 
Um, what happens if, if a man and woman who are married have children? Do those children usually get abandoned also? You know? When the... If, if the, the wife woman. is, if the woman is raped and she and her husband have children? Yes, some of them, some men keep uh, the children. children, but we have uh, two two systems. So depending on uh, tradition or uh, ethnic group. Okay. So we are group or we call pa patriarchal. So children belong to the father. And another group called, called matriarchal, mm -hmm. uh, children belong to the mother. So in a matriarchal situation, so children will go with their mother. And I, just one other question. If the, the man is abandoning his wife, do either of them marry someone else typically? There is some uh, many situations. Some some of them have uh, many are polygamists. Oh. And uh, if he's uh, he have only one wife, he can marry another woman. After that. So you can kind of leave because of the shame, and then just leave that behind and start the new life. New. Yeah. Do most of the women have that opportunity? So be, she, because she represents uh, shame, yeah. there's no... Right, she probably will not. Yes. Well, so. <coughs> the type of rape, it's not just sexual assault. You talk specifically like the type of rape it is. It's, it, it's much more violent than just rape. Like they're raped with weapons and tools. The, it's not just sexual assault, so which is bad enough. It's not, it's not rape on a scale that we would consider in the United States. It, it really is for the purpose of tearing communities apart. So, and, and it's done through the woman. So that repair, not just mentally, but literally physical repair, a lot of women do not repair completely from that at all, so. And who's doing all the raping? It's just the soldiers that are raping these women. So rebels, soldiers, because they, they they think that raping a woman gives them more power to go to to war or fight. Yeah. And sometimes it's even um, with we I had mentioned briefly that there's child soldiers who are brought into this situation, and sometimes as as a child soldier, they're forced to rape women as a sign of like as a way to hurt these children and kind of psychologically get them in the mode of this, this is, means that you have power. So it's children who are, who are forced to do this as well. It's, it's really an issue of this power and inequality amongst women. Um, that's just, it's being demonstrated to use to, um, to just tear these communities apart. Any other comments on that? Um, if you just want to go back, I have one other quick video here. It briefly talks about um, the conflict. It's more of a discussion on the importance of women. And it also talk, it's a little bit redundant um, from the last video we watched, but it's quick, so we can just take a quick look at that. <coughs> First and foremost, we're terrible mothers for us. Yeah, exactly. Mama's boys. Of course, because at the end, no matter how old you are, you are the mama's boy. And then you understand that they were right. Mm -hmm. And everything they said, everything. And no matter how hard you tried to fight against them, they were right. So this gives us a chance to reflect a little bit on the state of mothers and daughters all around the world. We're here to talk about one particular place. Yes, and uh, well, basically the most dangerous place for being a mother and a daughter is Congo. In the entire world, in the entire world, highest rates of sexual violence 
against women and girls occur in the Congo. Rape as a war of rape of something that happens in Congo. It's incredible to think about that. It's happening in order for us to get the best material for our cell phones, yeah. not for laptops. Every one of us has a cell phone or a laptop or an iPod or something, some kind of electronic product that we use pretty much every day that is powered by the minerals that come straight from the Congo. So your direct connection. You're a half mind. Oh, yep. Yeah. We gotta admit, we gotta, we gotta tell the truth. And I have a part laptop, of it. and I have a computer, and I have a, a hardline phone, mm -hmm. and all of, the, all of them are, uh, they have this material that are coming straight from the Congo, which create this misery, which in other words is to say that our wealthy life is based on the misery of others. That we know. But as the diamonds happen, as the blood diamonds happen yes. in Sierra Leone and many other countries, some other countries, <coughs> when people stood up and said, enough, we are not going to buy more blood diamonds, that has created a big change in those countries. You know? And that's what we need to do with Congo. And if we start to say together, wait a minute, yes, we're going to buy it, but we want to buy products that aren't contributing to this terrible atrocities in the Congo. Give us conflict-free cell phones. Give us rape-free laptops. That's the kind of message we need to send to these companies, and we can actually make a difference. We can change things. And we really need to demand to the companies and to the governments free conflict minerals or laptops or cell phones. Rape-free uh, minerals. So we got to get our government yes. to do the right thing. And the great news is the mother in chief, Hillary Clinton. Mother's Day, <laughs> the mother in chief, Hillary Clinton. Our <laughs> Secretary of State, she actually went to the Congo and was very deeply moved by the plight of women and girls there. So on a Mother's Day, <laughs> we ask Mother Chief, <laughs> Hillary Clinton, to help us to do that because actually, as a mother, she will understand what it means to be a mother and, and what the circumstances for many mothers out there. On Mother's Day, for any of us who has a laptop or a cell phone, let's give the mothers and the daughters of Congo a chance for peace. So that just kind of repeated a bit of what the last one said. It gave you kind of another look at um, what it's like there and what's going on. Before we move on to talking about the local community, is there any other questions about specifics in the Congo, what's happening there? Anyone have any just comments or anything? Yep. So is the majority of the fighting right now happening on the eastern border? Yeah, the majority of the conflict is still in the eastern part of the Congo. You mentioned that I mean, women are in a bit of a fix there growing up. So how does that reflect to like boys and girls growing up in the community? Do they do the boys learn to like respect the girls or are they taught not to respect them? Do you want to answer that one? Did you guys hear that? The question was no. how um how are children, boys and girls specifically, affected by the what's happening to women in the Congo? Um, are boys taught to respect the the girls and the women, or what's happening there? Yeah. So when if you were a woman, you have power, yeah. and if if you believe that. I don't think that you have respect for women, so you try to have more power. And uh, those children are not are not growing up in a safe environment, so they are most of the time in the mining and uh, that, like uh, as she say, parents uh, don't have enough money to send their children to college or school. And those children, they are, they are in the streets. So I don't know 
what you can learn from the street in uh, those area where it's uh, all web is all over the place and uh, militias and uh, to save your children you they have to stay home so if they go outside they can be cut from militias and uh, be involved in uh, those militias and uh, send in, in the mining or army so they are think in a situation like they don't know what to do to educate their children or to give them a good environment to grow in. Um, I, I don't know if you, like, you don't have to answer this, but um, like, I, even though Mark didn't grow up in the eastern side of the Congo, what were you kind of taught as a child, or young Bert also, what were you taught growing up, like, or what was it like? I've been in the war for six six days in my life. I was six years old, and uh, I still remember that uh, we ran out of water. And uh, my mother, I don't know how it's that the courage or so she went out with all the situation outside, the ballots and everything, but she went out to look for water. But I thank God because she always, all usually can, came home with water. But growing up in a, that kind of situation, I don't, so I don't know how to explain, but for me it's like a picture. And I, every day of my life, I learn from uh, that picture. How, how she can, she could decide to go out to risk her own life for, for me. And I still, seeing my father sitting in the corner quiet all the time my mother was out he was quiet he couldn't speak or talk or do anything I'm thinking what was going on in his mind during because anything could happen so what was going on in his mind so what my mother thought when she decided to go outside, so she was she was in a dilemma, lose my family or put my life in risk and try to save my family. So for me, I was just six years old, I couldn't understand. So I was expecting everything from my parents. I think they did the right thing because <coughs> today I'm here and I'm learning from uh, their decision. So growing in the Eastern or the, any place in the Congo, so we need to have example. So if parents don't have the ability to provide us, to give us an example, I think we'll be lost. Amber, did you have anything to add? Yep. Sorry. What has been the international community's response to what's happening currently in, in Eastern Congo? Like, has the UN sort of become involved or what? I can say I I took a relation international class here at ISU. I was the only one against all the professor was saying about the UN. 
And I don't believe UN anymore because they've been here for more since the conflicts. They are there. They're still there. We have many militias came in Congo and do whatever they can do to steal our coltan and everything. So what are they doing? They are there. They are seeing. We have report from them, but women are still raping. The UN soldiers in the Congo are often have been accused of rape and participating right. in it, and they're, they played a huge part in raping women. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing, an issue that's brought up often is that the UN soldiers are also being accused of being there and raping women as well. Okay, any other questions, comments on that? So, Blooming to normal, a lot of people are surprised here that we have one of the largest Congolese populations in the Midwest. Um, we're working on getting some exact numbers, but I mean, there's a few hundred. Do you guys have a better estimate? So I'm still working on, but I can say two to three hundred. Yeah, probably close to three hundred Congolese here in Blooming to normal. Um, a lot of a lot of the Congolese come here. Um, it's a chain migration situation, so a lot of people know somebody and then they come and then they tell their brother to come and their cousin and their friend and uh, they're a very supportive community for each other. Um, a lot of people, Jan Bert had mentioned that he works at Syntas, so a lot of people go through the same companies to get jobs. Uh, it's a, there are certain companies like Syntas who are very supportive of the Congolese community and are aware of this chain migration and have just continued to hire people from the Congo as, as they're coming here. Uh, also, we have Heartland here and we have ISU and other colleges and so it's a really nice opportunity for Congolese here. Since the local Congolese community, many of them have degrees. So, Yambert, what was your degree in the Congo? I'm studying lawyer. I'm yeah. a lawyer in my country. Mm -hmm. And Mark? Yeah, uh, engineer in uh, electronic radio yes. transmission. So Mark went, was an engineer, Albert was a lawyer, and they come here and their, their job experience and their degrees aren't recognized at all. So coming here to Bloomington, uh, they're able to get back into education. They start, most of them start at Heartland and then transfer to ISU and they get a whole other degree and have to go through that all over again. Um, so Bloomington's kind of been just a place where everyone's kind of coming together here. Uh, like I said, it's a very supportive community. Uh, people will come here and they'll live with someone for a month or two, they'll help people, they'll help each other pay for rent to get started, um, and so it's a really tight-knit community. Do you guys want to say anything about that? Yeah, so I, when I, I came here, I chose Bloomington because I knew a friend of mine was here, and uh, he agreed to give me a place to stay and start. And, uh, after, I think after two months, moved to Cincinnati, so I was, uh, I, would, I just started my uh, job and uh, be able to pay for my rent. And, uh, since then, I uh, paid my own rent and uh, able, be able to help other friends, Congolese brothers and sisters, because I obviously, I help many of my friends, my uh, Two sister and cousin. Number, do you want to talk about when you came here or how or why you came here? But uh, I'm not sure, just I have uh, one brother to live with you. Mm -hmm. so when, uh, when I did come here, that was how uh, I live uh, now. And then, you look at 
research. So these are just some pictures um, before we can kind of get into a discussion. Like I said, as more and more Congolese have come here, um, we had started One Heart for Congo, and we you know, do events and presentations, and we work very closely with Heartland Community College and ISU. We've recently started working more with Wesleyan, um, and we've been giving presentations, holding events, raising awareness. We've sent some aid back to the Congo. Um, if you want to go more, I think that's... But yeah, just some topics on getting involved. But um, if, do you guys have any questions or want to discuss anything? Do you guys have anything else to say? Yeah, it's uh, moving to a new country. Uh, can harm, harm for us because especially in Zimbabwe, uh, because when I graduate in my country, I was like, okay, done with uh, school. So now I can start thinking about the new job, my own family, so go for what? So after. I was working in a cell phone, co cell phone company like a Spring Horizon back home. But the political situation in the country is not that good. You can think future and be sure that I'm going there, I'll be there for after three or five years. So, yeah, it's not stable. and. You are not sure, so that when I uh, won the lottery, I didn't think twice. I was like, okay, let go and give my uh, job. So when I came here, I couldn't uh, find a job with uh, my uh, degree from uh, back home. So I okay, okay, well, let's start over. So start at uh, Heartland, working on my. Uh, English and be able to face uh, all the college, American college, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, everything worked fine for me because uh, this is my last semester and uh, hoping to find a job after. <laughs> <laughs> Most of you guys who come here and finish school, do you plan on going back and trying to help your people out there? Somehow? Yeah, we have a family there, and uh, every day we think about them because even they have a stable job today, we are not sure for tomorrow. So we saw many companies like uh, Star Cell, Telecell. It's a powerful company, but uh, they are not, they are no longer existing in the Congo. So my own parents, they passed away, but they, they were working for Shekami. It uh, was a powerful, a huge company, it was extracting uh, cobalt, Sense everything, but today the company is down. So I remember when I was a uh, little boy, I was saying, Okay, I'll be like that, I'll be like that, I'll walk the same place uh, like that. But it's no longer existing that company. So a lot of fun, Mabuchu is in power, you know, he had try to push a lot of the international <coughs> out and then bring them back in. And so it's been kind of like an iffy situation for these companies coming back into the Congo, um, certain ones at least. Uh, yeah, um, and now since you came here, do you go back often to Congo? 
Yeah, I couldn't go back because it's a two days trip. And when my uh, mother passed away, I was here, but I couldn't uh, go back because uh, my job at that time allowed me to have five day vacation only. So if you go two days round trip, you need four days. So, so I uh, couldn't go back, but I'm planning to go after I graduate. So I'll have uh, plenty of time to go and uh, stay for a while. Mark, I think part of his question, he wondered if many Congolese people plan to move back to Congo after you get your degree, or if you plan to stay here and just help from here. Yeah, I so. I can talk for them, <laughs> I'm talking for them, but, but uh, the idea, when I talk to we talk in the community, we all think about our country. But the reason why I can't go back right now, it's because the situation. But if things can change, and be more safe for myself and uh, what I can do for my country. So I'll be back. What about you, Albert? Do you plan on going back, moving back? Yeah. When I, when I have a graduate, okay. I come back to my country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was the culture shock like? Whenever you came here from the Congo, like was that like really intense? So it's very different. Kind of it's a difference. Different. So the the only thing I uh, like because we uh, francophone country and uh, difference between American and uh, French people. If you are speaking French and you make a mistake, French people will laugh at you. <laughs> uh, they don't say the, only la papa, only le papa, not la papa. So for American, even you are making mistake, they are encourage you. Say okay, you did great. You did okay. Go. <laughs> so that the uh, first thing that I like in uh, this country because you are help, helping me to go forward. And even in class, some um, uh, time, many times I was front of <laughs> make a presentation. So. You can see that they are not laughing at you, but uh, they are trying to. And uh, in uh, many situations, even they don't understand what you are talking about. They pay attention. They give you all the opportunity to make yourself express and uh, give what you want to give for them to understand. Might be a good opportunity to talk about what we do on Sundays. Yeah, yeah, I can mention that. But yeah, just really quick, I just want to talk about also, it's, I think it's really important for people to be aware of the Congolese community here, and that's part of the reason why we're doing this. Um, and not only that, but other immigrant communities as well. Um, as kind of what Mark was saying, it's being here is really important for them, especially and like context of what's going on in their home country and having the opportunities that they do here is really important um, and just for us to like for people to be aware of what's of what is going on in these communities um, or the community here I think it's just really a good thing um, and I just I lost my train of thought so I'm just gonna go with what Tracy was saying really fast um, <laughs> Um, every Sunday, so what we kind of do as an organization to 
uh, encourage growth in the community is we have something called Let's Talk and we have every Sunday upstairs here. Sometimes we move down here if we have a big crowd of people. Uh, but we, it's called Let's Talk and it's just an opportunity for Congolese and Americans or anyone to get together and practice English and we have a list of questions that we work off of and we'll ask <coughs> questions and we it's a great way to exchange culture um, exchange language and we've had some French students come and they've just practiced their French we'll do like someone will go over to the side and they'll have a language exchange sometimes uh, so it's a really neat opportunity and we learn a lot from each other and it's a lot of fun Yes, I got uh, another thing. In uh, our community, we don't have a chance to practice English when we are between Com Congolese. Yeah. So we just speak uh, Lingala, French, and Congo, Swahili. So we don't have uh, that uh, opportunity to practice uh, English. And uh, one letter, it. Uh, one way how we can uh, practice and uh, improve uh, our English because uh, in school <coughs> there is only some topics we can talk about and uh, we are limited in the class but uh, outside of class like lecture we are open to any idea or topics and there's information about that on the flyer over there too. Maybe you have something? Yeah. So um, in Congo, you guys, when you go to school, you're taught in French, correct? Yes. So when you come here, you have to take some uh, college classes in English first, correct? Yes. In Congo, we have uh, an English program. It's not intense. Oh, okay. And th does that start in grade school or? So English program is high school, yeah. high school, yeah, in high school. Many Congolese who come here, some of them don't even know any English when they come here, especially the women um, won't know any English. And women, we haven't really talked about that at all, but women in this community, it's kind of hard to engage them. Um, just a lot in part because the men are the ones who are out working and, have, and are going to school and kind of follow that similar cultural role that they do back in the Congo. And women are staying home and taking care of the children in the house. A lot of women are working here who are from the Congo, um, but not really in jobs or areas where they have an opportunity to practice or learn English. Um, and uh, it depending on uh, area, because uh, mm -hmm. I went, I grew up in the South, South of <coughs> we have uh, English program, Swahili program, because uh, in the south we have uh, Swahili program, in the east, Swahili, in the northeast, Swahili, but the northwest, uh, northwest. But, uh, in, Nala, in the west we have Congo, in the central we have uh, Chiluba, include in the program, besides French. So English was included in the south, but I'm not sure about uh, the other area. Yeah, there's so many languages spoken within the Congo, and so um, you're learning other languages spoken in the Congo mostly. Um, so it's such a big country. And even though you speak French and Swahili, there's other parts of the country that don't speak any French. And so maybe if you're going to school, you're studying those languages and not necessarily English. So. And also, yeah. Oh, I have a question. Um, so, how is the whole like um, immigration process go? Like, do you apply to come here on a visa, or how do you actually like leave your country? Yeah, you mentioned the lottery. You mentioned the lottery, lottery really. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of that. I, my dad has told me that they have that in some countries, but like when you come here, do you apply to be a citizen, and then do you like 
So yeah. if you got selected from the lottery, so you automatically have a permanent resident card, a green card. Yeah. So you have to pay uh, for the visa only. Yeah, yeah. I paid seven hundred seventy-five per person. So beside that fee, you have uh, all the paper you need to provide with uh, pictures, photograph, and everything. And you, during my, when I won, so you have to go in Cameroon, that for Central Africa. So we had an embassy in Congo, but because the conflict, they couldn't process the DV uh, stuff there. So we have to go to in Cameroon. So you pay the ticket from Congo to Cameroon and you have to pay your living in come during wedding all the processes. And when you get the visa, you pay the ticket from Cameroon to here. So the total can cost you around five thousand So if you have uh, three children like today, so I have to pay uh, twenty-five thousand. Mark, how does the lottery work? It, does anyone have the same chance of coming here, or do you have a greater chance if you have more education, or if you know someone here, or are there different factors <coughs> So to be selected, you need to have a high school degree or a professional experience. That's the first thing. So if you don't have any any of the uh, high school or professional skills, you are not uh, you'll be rejected. Yeah. Okay. Is that the only thing? You just need that certain education and then you apply and just wait for yeah. them to pick between you and all the other people who have an education? Yes. Yes. The American government usually sets cups of countries, so some countries get more. Yeah, I know that there it's not a very high number for the lottery in the Congo. Do you know how many people are? It's not a lot. So the highest was uh, 700. Yeah. I know Nigeria was 5,000 per year. There aren't many people from the Congo tour. And to think 700 and Bloomington has about 300. Like, people here now. It's or do you have to reapply every few years or? So every year. Every year to be able to stay? No. So you have the green card for 10 years. 10 years. So after five years of residence, you can apply for citizenship. Oh. And so are there other like um, citizens of Congo who come here as students on an F1 visa or work H1 visa or something like that? Yes, yeah, so a friend of mine was here, but uh, you can, uh, if you have, uh, after you graduate, if you have a job, they can help you to have a green card here. Stay here. There's a question in the back. Yeah. I, I heard people talk about the communities of Congolese and Champagne and also Peoria. Do you have some connection with the, um, them in these neighboring cities? Yeah, in uh, Champagne, we, we are in contact with uh, Champagne. So is it, if you say there are two to three hundred Congolese here, it, then, or are you also counting Champagne and Peoria? Only, only Bloomington. No. So there could be as many in Champagne. Yes, I think Champagne is uh, biggest than Bloomington. Any other questions? Yeah. Is One Heart for the Congo, like as part of their, I guess their mission or whatever, do they, are they um, involved in helping um, Congolese people with like applying for citizenship and going through, I know there's a, there's a whole bunch of channels that one has to go through in order to even 
consider getting uh, citizenship, but is that, that another thing that they're kind of involved in? I know they offer support for each other, but is there also like, as like, oh, I'm an American, I know a little bit about American history, I'll help you study for that big citizenship <laughs> test. We, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Immigration Project in downtown Bloomington, uh, but they work directly to, um, to process citizenship applications and it's a free service for for immigrants to go through and to get their citizenship. Um, most of our Congolese haven't been here long enough to get citizenship. So, um, but the ones who have have who have gone through that, and we have partnered with them with the Immigration Project. They've held some presentations for our community, which is really nice to have that relationship with them. Um, yeah, but so we had one, uh, I think, two months ago. Yeah, we yeah we just had one not too long ago. To Auckland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we we do work with them. Um, the One Heart for Congo and the community in general kind of works to support each other in helping them find jobs, um, driver's license, homes, a variety of different things. So. Any other questions? Yeah. So what are things, what are the big things that stick out, like what you were saying? What are things that are still needed? So I get phone calls every once in a while from the, um, the, um, the health center that they need translators. Um, and of course, there's uh, transcripts that I do. But what are, what, what are the big things that stick out for people here that they need now? There's the Unity Center. Student, children are going to the Unity Center. So what are, what are the big things that really stick out that people can do right here, right now, in this area? Yeah, I'm myself a translator to Western Avenue. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not available most of the time. Every time they are calling, they call me. And uh, many Congolese are interesting for going back to school and they don't have enough information about uh, about that I think if we provide them with uh, enough information how school or education here are set because they are it's different than uh, Congo, so they have uh, like he have a degree in uh, in law. So I think he have to start over. But uh, I'm myself forced to take a biology class. They didn't agree. So they didn't give me credit for what I took back home. So I was just bored in class. The only thing changed was the language. So it was like, but uh, people, many of them don't know that they can transfer the class from Congo to here. So and what they can do, they need to translate to provide the uh, course description. <coughs> So they need, so they, I did mine by myself. <laughs> so I think they, they'll need that to, they need that uh, help, kind of help to be able to skip many classes they already had in Congo. I think language is a big thing, just getting people more, people in the community to language exchange or to help with English. Even a big thing that can be really helpful and um, is to have people to help with, you know, maybe looking over a paper that they write for school. Or, I think that's a huge thing that people are from the Congo, you know, they're coming to school here, they go through a year of ESL training, and then they're thrown into a university. And then they have to write these papers, and they're working full time, and they have families, and they're trying to be successful in school, and it's very difficult. So I think having Having that community support, maybe having a network of um, of people who like could look through and um, assist with that would be something that's useful. Yeah, I had myself a problem uh, last semester. The professor did uh, 
agree with me because uh, every time when we have exam, they give exam for an hour, for example. So when I read the question, I read it in English, translate it in French to be able to better understand it and to retranslate in English and pick the answer. For American, they vote, okay. So I need more time. So an hour, it's not enough for me. So I many times I talk to professor, but last semester that professor didn't uh, agree, send me to the disability office by the disability service. So this is not a disability, so we can do anything. I think there's something you could do because they have, the, for the state of Illinois uh, tests, they have for Spanish speakers, they allow them extra time. All the so, professors said, uh, we said together at time, so you can come, mm -hmm. go to the uh, tutoring center, you can have 30, minute, 30 more minutes for that, but uh, the one who didn't give me that uh, opportunity, so I was failing before to take the exam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the that's uh, another thing you can think about for models, comrades. Any other questions, comments? I don't want to find out who that professor was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we also, we also have planning meetings every other Sunday um, following our Let's Talk meetings, and we um, plan things for the organization, we talk about things like this, like what can we do, what else can we do to contribute to um, helping out the community. Um, if you guys, you, everyone's welcome to come to that. Again, it's every Sunday upstairs here from three to four is Let's Talk, and every other Sunday from four to five is our planning meetings. Yeah. Is this where most of your events happen, or is there a community center or an office for one? Our office is upstairs. <laughs> yeah, no, we we don't have enough. We're a small organization, and you know, it's it's kind of difficult because most of us are in school. We work, and then almost everyone from the Congo is in school, works, and has full time and has a family. So um, we meet upstairs, and we ha we have had multiple events here. Um, like I said earlier, we collaborate with Heartland and ISU a lot, so we'll have events with both of those universities. Um, and there's sporadic presentations. We have lots of presentations. We did one at Normal Community High School. Um, we've done them at churches. We've done them all over. So yeah, we can, we work in the community a lot. And yeah. When's your next Let's, Let's Talk meeting? Is that, because Easter is next Sunday. So are you guys ready? We'll yeah. probably not have yeah. it next Sunday. Not. Um, yeah, but so the following Sunday. Mm -hmm. And also, if you guys, having the day after Chicago. Yeah, because yeah, the six is we're about we're planning a trip to Chicago. Where um, there's a global expo in Chicago. Yeah, it's uh, yeah global expo. It's every year, and we're going to be going. And that's April six, yeah. which is the following week after Easter. So. Yeah. If you guys tentatively will have a meeting. We're gonna have a meeting again sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just have a couple of things coming Yeah. Up, so. Um we do have a Facebook page and I try to post on there every week and just say like, hey, we're having lunch stock or if by the off chance we're not having it, I'll post that. Um so that's a good way to find out information about what's going on as well. And again, there's flyers up there with all of our information on there. Any other questions, comments? Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you, Common Action Free School. Thanks for being here.